Hello everyone! Thank you very much for listening to my concert. Today I'm going to be performing for you music by the so-called English Virginalists. English Virginalists were a group of composers writing at the end of the Renaissance period and the beginning of Baroque period. However, the music stylistically is largely really Renaissance and I think it will be very clear from the music itself once you hear it. Now today all the music I will be performing will be from the Fitzwilliam Virginal book. Virginal books are the source for us today that contains all the keyboard music of the Renaissance period. There are many of them surviving. The Fitzwilliam Virginal book is the biggest one that contains a vast collection of the composers from different countries, mostly from England, but also Italy, France, uh, Netherlands. Uh, the book itself is nowadays at the Fitzwilliam Museum in England. However, it's not Fitzwilliam. It's not a person named Fitzwilliam who wrote it or compiled it. And I will mention that later. Uh, the reason why it's called a virginal book, or all of them called virginal books, is because a virginal at the time was a term used in England for any sort of keyboard instrument, including harpsichords, virginals, uh, musolars, um, spinets, uh, or and even organs. And the music uh, written at the time was intended to be really played on any of them. So I could have chosen virginal, but I uh, chose a harpsichord to play today for you, and it, it's legitimate. Now, um, however, I just wanted to mention that a virginal. Uh, is a little uh, plucked instrument. It's a type of a harpsichord that is small. It doesn't have any. Uh, it doesn't have. It only has one kind of sound as opposed to uh, most harpsichords. Uh, but it's small. It's very uh, convenient to have uh, at someone's apartment because of its size. And it has usually a very distinct sound. You actually often can tell when a virgin was played. Uh, now, the composers that I will be performing today are, almost all of them, very well known. Uh, William Byrd is probably the most prolific and the most well known of them all, of the virginal, uh, of the Renaissance composers. Um, William, uh, so William Byrd also transcribed the piece by Joan Doland that I'm playing today, that, who was a very famous uh, lute composer at the time, and uh, Bird was not the only one trans transcribing his pieces, and it's a truly beautiful music. Uh, John Bull uh, is another very famous keyboard composer, and he uh, is pretty famous for being really, uh, his pieces are particularly technically challenging, and I have to say that even though these pieces are early, um, it's very, uh, it's, they're very challenging very often, they're hard to play. And um, however, and now I come to the creator of the Twilight Immersion book. The last piece I'll be performing is not by a famous uh, Renaissance composer. The last piece, if you look at the title and the composer's name, all you can see is F-R-E as the composer's name. And Apparently, it's attributed to uh, Francis Trajan the Younger. And he's an important figure as it, when it comes to a Fitzwilliam, Fitzwilliam Virginal book, because apparently, according to a story, which some say is a legend, however, I did read um, a lot of information saying that this story might be quite legitimate. It might have happened. Um, so the story goes that Francis Trajan the Younger was a huge music lover and a composer himself. And he was a Catholic and he was not proud of the uh, Protestant Reformation in England. So because of that, apparently, he didn't want to pay his taxes. And he was put in prison for that, for 10 years. And while he was in prison, he compiled together and wrote, well, wrote and compiled the Fitzwilliam Virginal book. And the piece I'm playing by him today, it's called Heaven and Earth. And uh, when I saw the title, I was quite fascinated. Um, and then I played the piece and I really liked the music. So I hope you enjoyed it too. Now I want to talk a little bit about the space I'm in. Um, my other 
job besides being a musician and being a harpsichordist is actually building harpsichords. And I work at the largest harpsichord factory in the country. It's called Zuckerman Harpsichords International. We're located in Stonington, Connecticut, and this is the showroom that I'm at, at the factory. And my duty at the shop is to finish the harpsichords or other instruments, not just harpsichords, clavichords and virginals too, by the way. Um, and what I do is I get the box, just a wooden box. It doesn't have any strings or any means for it to make a beautiful musical sound. And I make it happen. I do all the work that, re that uh, is required in order to, for a box to become a harpsichord. So this particular harpsichord is a Flemish style harpsichord, a uh, single manual, as you can see. Uh, you can see the decorations, the Flemish papers inside of it. It's a very common um, kind of decorations for a Flemish instrument. It has uh, two sets of strings. Uh, both of them are eight foot, so regular pitch. I am employing both of them at the same time for most pieces, except for the Pavana Lacrime. And you probably will hear that it will sound differently, that piece. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention that's very... two things, actually, that are very important. First of all, the tuning. Um, this instrument is tuned in a standard quarter comma mean tone, so the difference between the mean tone is and the regular equal uh, temperament that you uh, most of uh, people are used to today is that in the equal temperament, any key, no matter what key you choose, will sound the same. However, in the mean tone, they will not. And just to demonstrate to you really quickly, I will play a C major chord, and then I'll play a B major chord, and you will hear a big difference in the sound. <laughs> Some will say this is very out of tune. It is not out of tune. Just the way this temperament works is it works really well for certain keys and it does not work at all for certain keys. But the Renaissance music was only written in a very limited number of keys and they will all work in this temperament. So I didn't have to worry about, about that. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is the fingering. Um, a couple of videos I intentionally uh, shot the way a couple of pieces. I intentionally made the way it's, you can see my hands on the keyboard. And if you're a pianist, you will look at my the, the fingerings I'm using and think that I'm crazy. And what I do is I use the, um, largely, not maybe not all the time, but as much as I can, I use the historical fingerings. And um, it's the whole um, largely debated topic nowadays and many people attempt to do that and the interesting thing about the historical fingerings is that they do not make it easier to play the pieces quite the opposite however what they do is they dictate in many cases your articulation which is very interesting and that's why people choose to use them even though they might necessarily not might not necessarily be the most convenient ones now, on this note, I'm going to finish, and I hope you enjoy the concert, and again, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, um, maybe, you know, you can leave them in the comments to the YouTube videos or video, and I'll try to answer them um, to my best ability. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed.